11 programs in Indonesia. And for this special occasion, we welcome our distinguished guest, Professor Robert Huber, the Nobel Laureate in Chemistry, 1988. We also welcome Professor Akhmaloka, Rector of Institute Technology Bandung, who is here with us this morning to officially open this seminar. So again, we welcome all the participants from the Indonesian Chemical Society and participants from universities all over Indonesia. Hadirin yang kami hormati, ladies and gentlemen, first, we would like to invite Professor Yana Maulana Shah the chairman of the organizing committee to deliver his speech. Dan kami persilahkan Profesor Yana Maulana Shah. Rector Institute Technology Bandung, Deans of Faculty and Schools, and staff member of ITB, colleges from institutions and universities, ladies and gentlemen, let me start with Muslim Salam. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. On behalf of the organizing committee, I, I would like to welcome you to Aula Barat Institute Technology Bandung. In particular, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Professor Robert Huber, Nobel Laureate 1988 in Chemistry, for his presence here in Bandung to deliver an important and interesting lecture this morning. Welcome to the invited speakers and guests. Welcome also to you all. We are delighted here to have all of you here to participate in one day seminar with Huber. This seminar is a part of a program relating to the International Year of Chemistry 2011, organized in collaboration between Indonesian Chemical Society and the Chemistry Program, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences of ITB. We are aware that many of you travel long distances. This reminds us all just how important the seminar is. One day seminar with Huber brings senior and young scientists together in one forum to allow interactions among them, particularly what the young scientists can learn from the experience of the senior scientists. Of course, more importantly, the lecture from Professor Huber will be the focus of the seminar Equally important is from now until afternoon, we will also follow a number of lectures from our prominent senior scientists of different fields, presenting their life achievements. The organizing committee hopes that this one day seminar will benefit all the audience here. Therefore, we are very honored to have Professor Robert Huber, Professor Samsu Arifin Ahmad, Professor Effendi, Professor Alfianur, and Dr. Sihareti Suhardi. Their efforts need no introduction. The result presented today will speak for themselves. In closing, I thank all the members of the organizing committee for their work hard to prepare this seminar. I also thank our sponsors for their generous financial support so that the seminar comes to realization. Wish the seminar a complex success. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih, Professor Yana Maulana Shah. Hadirin yang kami hormati, ladies and gentlemen, the next speaker 
we invite Dr. Muhammad Abdul Qadir Marto Prawiro, the President of the Indonesian Chemical Society. Dr. Muhammad Abdul Qadir, kami persilakan. Uh, our distinguished guest, Professor Robert Huber, uh, our all the speakers, Rector of ITB and Vice Rector of the ITB, thank you for coming to this uh, event. Uh, all speakers, uh, our college students, good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ini lagi batuk di suaranya agak aneh. Uh, I'm really glad to have all participants from various universities and research centers uh, to uh, join us today to this inspirational event, hopefully, hopefully. Uh, I would like to let you know uh, one information that next year is the golden anniversary of the Indonesian Chemical Society. The society was established in 1962, so next year, it's 2012, will be the golden anniversary. So we will have uh, many activities that uh, make our society uh, stronger and um, benefit to all of us, to our country, and to our society. Uh, I would like to let you know that uh, some of the activity next year is the International Conference of the Indonesian Chemical Society in Malang, five and four and five September 2012. Uh, I would like to also uh, let you know that in the first time we invite high school students to present a small project at their school in chemistry at that conference. So also teachers to share their uh, experiences in teaching and learning at school. We have a collaboration with Oracle Education Foundation to motivate teachers to do, uh, to, uh, do many activities uh, other than teaching and learning in the classroom. Uh, again, thank you for all. Uh, I hope uh, this seminar will uh, be successful for all of us. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih banyak, Bapak Dr. Muhammad Abdul Qadir. Hadirin yang kami hormati, ladies and gentlemen, now we would like to invite Professor Akmaloka, Rector of Institute Technology Bandung, to give his speech and to officially open the seminar. Professor Akmaloka, kami persilakan. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Yang saya hormati Ketua Himpunan Kimia Indonesia Dr. Muhammad Abdul Qadir Marto Prawiro Bapak-bapak, ibu-ibu Para senior saintis di Indonesia Saya tidak bisa menyebut satu-satu namanya Ada mulai Pak Barmawi, Pak Bukhari, uh, Profesor uh, Susanto, uh, yang dari Unpad, Profesor Albert, uh, Pak, ini saya kira lot of Indonesian as new scientists here. Yeah. Excellencies, Profesor Robert Hubert, Bapak Ibu hadirin yang saya hormati, selamat pagi, good morning, assalamualaikum. It is a great pleasure to welcome such an eminent gathering of scientists to our campus 
Institute Technology Bandung, the oldest academic institution in Bandung, for one day seminar with Huber. I would like to extend a particular warm welcome to Professor Robert Huber, one of the Nobel Prize winner for chemistry. I wish you a pleasant stay in Bandung. Also, let me add the word of welcome to our senior and young scientists that come from various academic institutions and universities in Indonesia. This seminar is the result of collaboration between Indonesian Chemical Society and the Department of Chemistry, Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences of ITB. As part of the program of the International Years of Chemistry 2011, ITB always welcome to host academic gathering like today's seminar. And I note that this is the first time in Indonesia that we can hear directly from prominent scientists like Professor Huber presenting his important achievement in science or to be more specific in biochemistry of proteases. As biochemists, hopefully still biochemists, uh, probably uh, too many administration work now, I should mention that Professor Huber presentations of Proteus will inspire us on how important fundamental research to be carried out before we think of each application. To my knowledge, Professor Huber, Huber do his research on this engine since 1970s, starting on the basic pancreatic trypsin inhibitor. His work then extended to many different proteases, their proenzyme and complexes between them, as well as other hydrolytic enzymes like alpha amylase. From this fundamental research, Professor Huber find its application in medicine. I'm sure that you all find full story of his achievement on protease this morning. I also note that the seminar will present interesting talk from our senior scientists representing a number of scientific communities such as Professor Samsul Arifin Ahmad from Indonesian Society of Natural Product Chemistry, Professor Alfian Noor from Hassanuddin University, is quite far away from here, probably two or three hours flight. Professor Effendi, representing Indonesian Chemical Society, working on X-ray crystallography, but not in biological uh, matter, but in, in organic substance. And Dr. Sri Hariyati Suhadi, even I haven't seen it, her yet. Where's Reni? Not yet. Come from Indonesian Association on Biochemistry and Molecular Biology. Their presentation of their life achievement will certainly equally important for us. In conclusion, in welcoming all of you to Institute Technology Bandung and in declaring this conference open, can I say again that this seminar will find its objective and I do hope 
you will find it also the reward. Therefore, I have a great pleasure in declaring this seminar open. Thank you and wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Terima kasih banyak Bapak Profesor Akmaloka yang telah membuka seminar ini secara resmi. Hadirin yang kami hormati, ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to the time for keynote lecture given by Professor Robert Huber. This lecture will be guided by Professor Titania Chandrawati Nugroho. So now we invite Professor Titania to come to the chair. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, and Professor Hooper. Well, morning, I should say. Yes. May God bless us all on this wonderful month of the Ramadan. Uh, for those who are fasting, uh, I hope you all have a good Ramadan. Uh, it is a great honor. Uh, for us to have Professor Huber in the celebration of the International Year of Chemistry. This is the International Year in Chemistry in 2011 in Indonesia. And uh, thank you to the organizers uh, for giving me this honor to um, be a moderator for this uh, session. Professor Huber uh, has been at ITB since Monday and had given a lecture in front of 5,000 new ITB students yesterday, and also another lecture last Monday in this West Hall. I also would like to thank to all of the audiences to gather here in this very important event. It is a pleasure for us to welcome you all. Uh, Professor Huber, I will give a little bit uh, introduction uh, Professor Ahmaloka had already uh, given um, a little bit of his um, life story, but uh, I will also read out uh, something else. So, uh, Professor Hooper obtained a diploma and doctor in chemistry in 1960 from Technische Universität München. He works at Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry, Germany. He is also acting as visiting professor in uh, Barcelona, is that? And also at the United Kingdom. He is a member of many learned societies all across the globe in Germany, United Kingdom. Uh, among others, I will read to you. Uh, he is a member of the Deutsche Chemische Gesellschaft. He's also an honorary member of the American Society of Biological Chemists and also of the Swedish Society for Biophysics, EMBO, Japanese Biochemical Society, Associate Fe Fellow of the Third World Academy of Sci Sciences, and uh, many others in uh, the U.S. and also in Japan and Spain. Uh, he has been awarded a great number of honors. There are two numbers for me to read, but you can read it in the um, abstract book that is, uh, I hope you all have received. Uh, yesterday, ITB just gave Ganesha Widya Jasa Adi Utama Award, which is the most prestigious award from ITB to honor those who have made a significant contribution in the development of science and technology. Uh, Professor Huber, together with uh, Professor um, Michel and G. Dyson Hofer, 
uh, were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1988 for their work on determination of the three-dimensional structure of photosynthetic reaction center, and also for the first one who can crystallize membrane proteins. He has written about 750 scientific publications. That's a very large number. Professor Huber works focus on structure and function of biological mac macromolecules, in particular those of large complex aggregates, which we are going to hear in his lecture. He had also many methods in structure determination. He is also co-founder of biotech of the biotechnology company, Proteros. So he has a business side there, right? Professor Hooper, may I invite you please to deliver your lecture. Give a pause. Good morning. Well, I would like to thank again, as I did already, before, for the invitation to your beautiful country, Indonesia, and the city of Bandung, and uh, the ITB, most interesting place. Uh, thank you. And also thank you for the hospitality which I experienced. Thank you for your introduction and Rector for your introduction. Well, I had, I had been in this uh, auditorium on Monday to speak on proteins in a more general uh, way. Now, today I would like to focus on proteases, proteolytic enzymes uh, this is a family of proteins with which I actually started my uh, work in protein structures and protein crystallography in the late 60s, a long time uh, ago. Uh, the method of protein crystallography was not really well developed. So we had to build instruments. We had to uh, develop uh, tools and methods. Now, much has become uh, relatively routine, even in the field of protein crystallography, but there are still enormous challenges because also the problems have grown. And as you will see in my lecture, we started with relatively small proteins, about 100 or 200 amino acid residues, and now we work with proteins that have a few thousand of amino acid residues. They are very big. Now these are the challenges in the field of today. Now let me lead you uh, through uh, my work. Uh, on proteolytic enzymes and their regulation. This scheme shows, please follow the, uh, the pointer here, the mouse, so that you uh, can uh, see it on both uh, screens. So there is the nucleus, it's DNA, the hereditary material, from which the messenger RNA is, is, is transcribed, is exported from the nucleus into the cytosol and then bound by the ribosome, uh, which read this information and uh, synthesizes a polypeptide uh, chain. Now the polypeptide chain uh, is a flexible uh, molecule which, however, spontaneously folds up into a regular or a rigid uh, uh, structure. But uh, this is a rather sensitive molecule 
uh, and uh, upon heat or pressure or pH stress, uh, it becomes damaged and has to be removed when it's no longer functional by degradation. Now this is what the proteases do, as you will see. Now this is the major machine on which uh, proteins are synthesized under the direction of the RNA. Uh, we very recently uh, saw published the structure of the ribosome, a huge uh, molecule. This achievement was uh, honored with the Nobel Prize just uh, 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 in, in, in the year 2009, so just two years ago, to three scientists. This is a space filling surface representation uh, just to show how complex uh, and irregular, in a way, uh, these protein molecules are. This is where the active site is, uh, where the players uh, are bound, the message is bound, and the tRNA is bound to synthesize the polypeptide chain. Now, we do have, from these uh, crystallographic studies, an atomic view of this huge machine. But if you look at it under the electron microscope to get us an idea of the shape, uh, then we see uh, this picture. We see the message, the messenger RNA, uh, on which uh, ribosomes sit and walk along and synthesize the polypeptide chain here, this uh, uh, string that you see, this green string that you see here, uh, grows and grows as the ribosome walks along and reads uh, the message. Now this is this unfolded peptide chain which I mentioned before, which then spontaneously folds up. Well, this is just uh, a funny, uh, addition when we compare this electron uh, micrograph of an assembly of ribosomes on messenger RNA with a car factory, a Volkswagen car factory. Uh, now, uh, these car, modern car factories look quite different now. They use robots. But uh, uh, in, let's say, the 50s, 60s, uh, uh, people were assembling uh, a Volkswagen, which was then uh, growing along this assembly uh, line to its mature uh, form. So it was folding up uh, in a sense. Now this is the synthesis machine, but uh, folding from an unfolded polypeptide chain is a spontaneous but complicated process, and not all proteins make it uh, spontaneously. So they do not reach their functional folded form. They need some help. Uh, these are catalysts, folding catalysts, or so they are called chaperonins or chaperones. And uh, uh, Two of these objects, two of these enzymes you see here, uh, the one that occurs in bacteria, uh, analyzed by an American group uh, some years ago, and this the, uh, molecule we see in higher organisms, but also in archaebacteria. So these are large containers, hollow objects, which harbor an incompletely folded protein. So it isolates it from the environment. And it, it has some time then inside this container to fold up properly. If it does not, then a partly folded protein has a hydrophobic parts exposed uh, and is in danger of aggregation, and then it's lost, of course, for any functional uh, 
purposes. Well, this is a nice uh, uh, example of evolution that we see here in this protein structure as well. So this is a, an aggregate of uh, 14 uh, subunits. Uh, the subunits themselves are big molecules of about uh, seven or 800 amino acid residues composed of three uh, domains. This occurs, as I said, in bacteria. Now, the molecule that we investigated occurs in eukaryotes and in archibacteria. Uh, it consists of 16 uh, subunits, but the subunit structures uh, of the eukaryotic or uh, archaeal and the bacterial uh, uh, species are somewhat related and highlighted in these uh, three colors. Uh, I uh, used to say that the American version of the chaperone looks like a bullet, while the German the European version looks like a peaceful football. <laughs> but they do similar things. So this is a folding catalyst. The, so we, we have relatively few uh, of these. The ribosomes are conserved through all the living uh, world. If you look in bacteria or in, or in plants or higher organisms, chaperonins, we do have a few. But proteases, we do have many. Uh, uh, so, so this is a, a, a great difference. So we do have many proteolytic enzymes which are there in order to degrade uh, uh, proteins. About 500 of them, uh, quite different, which we can categorize according to the uh, central catalytic residue they have that are the so-called serine proteases, so the digestive enzymes, uh, trypsin, chymotrypsin, I'm sure you have heard of that, uh, are serine proteases, but there are many others that do have a catalytic serine, but have a, a structure which is quite different. There are metalloproteases, which use a metal for uh, their work. There are the aspartic proteases, to which, for instance, the HIV protease uh, belongs. There are the cysteine proteases, to which uh, papain belongs, which uh, was first uh, discovered in, uh, in, the fruit, uh, uh, in the papaya fruit, and so on and so forth. So uh, a very large diversity of proteinases. Now, Proteinases are necessary to degrade proteins uh, for uh, 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 nutritional purposes, for instance, uh, and also to degrade proteins that are uh, not properly functioning, as you will see uh, in a minute, but they are potentially very dangerous. If they are uncontrolled, they would just uh, chew the content of cells up so I am full of proteases, the clotting enzymes, for instance, which are, have to be carefully controlled. Otherwise, I would disappear in front of you, being digested down to my skeleton during my lecture uh, by my own proteolytic enzymes. So these, these are, as I said, very dangerous. They have to be controlled, and this is but I'm mainly uh, discussing this uh, morning. Now, as I already said, my beginnings in protein crystallography were with, with just this uh, uh, system with proteases and their uh, regulation, uh, in particular with the serine proteases, and the director had mentioned the basic pancreatic trypsin inhibitor this is the blue object that you see here in complex with uh, uh, trypsin. So this was the first example of 
showing how a protease is uh, regulated, how is it is inhibited, and it is inhibited simply by a close stereochemical fit of these two molecules. It's a very complicated surface, uh, but, but the two surfaces, that of the inhibitor and that of the enzyme, are strictly complementary. There is no structural change necessary when they interact. This was the uh, secret, and the solution of it, behind uh, the finding that these two molecules bind extremely tightly and strongly. Now the binding site of the inhibitor is the uh, binding site uh, for the substrate and we immediately understand why uh, this is an, an inhibitor uh, of uh, the uh, enzyme because substrate just can not bind to it. The binding site is blocked by the inhibitor. Now this was in the uh, late 60s, as I said, the first example of uh, uh, regulation of a protease. And we went on for, until now, uh, for 40 years or so, and studied many proteases uh, and found quite a diverse way of regulation. And this cartoon uh, now shows what kind of uh, regulatory mechanisms we found. So the first one you already saw with the trypsin, trypsin inhibitor uh, uh, situation. So we do have the enzyme, we have the substrate binding site, and we have this red uh, inhibitor molecule which precisely fits and so prevents any binding of the substrate. We do have enzymes, proteases, that are extremely specific. So they cleave only one peptide bond out of the millions of peptide bonds a protease sees when it uh, uh, is in a cell or is in circulation. And they are extremely specific because of uh, uh, an extremely complex uh, substrate binding site. So there are subsites for each of the amino acids in a longer peptide chain which is recognized by this enzyme. So we have examples, uh, for instance, the clotting enzymes, so the proteases in our blood have to be very specific. Uh, and, and they are an example of these highly specific proteases. Most of the proteases are made as precursors, inactive. And uh, they become activated by cleaving off a part, mostly an N-terminal part. Now the proenzymes are inactive because this pro part, which is a, usually a small folded piece of protein, uh, covers the active site, so we can understand that substrate cannot bind. Only after cleavage there is binding. But uh, uh, we also see examples that cleavage of the pro part leads to a structural rearrangement of the enzyme. We do have membrane-bound proteinases the membrane anchor, which only turn over a membrane-bound substrate. We do have uh, most of the clotting enzymes. They are fixed to the uh, uh, wall of uh, uh, blood vessels, so that their reaction is limited to the surface of the blood vessel. We do have cofactors. Uh, that this blue object, and only in the presence of the cofactor, then the substrate is stably bound and turned over. But also, we have examples where the blue cofactor then changes allosterically uh, the structure of the enzyme. So it binds somewhere, 
and causes conformational changes at the substrate binding site. So we have examples in these 40 years of research for all of these, but uh, the one I would like to concentrate on this morning is these huge proteolytic enzymes where uh, we found a novel way of regulation uh, in that sense that the active sites are buried inside a particle. So, uh, and uh, the regulation is by uh, closing and opening the entry. And of course only when the entry gate is open, substrate can diffuse in and be uh, turned over. And the last example, I would, a very recent one, the last uh, five or six years, where we found that a protease forms a cage after a signal by the substrate. So when the substrate, when the enzyme sees the substrate, it changes its oligomeric state and assembles around the, uh, the substrate such that it is degraded. Well, these are uh, these uh, last, uh, so the cage forming proteases uh, are shown here. Uh, this is the proteasome on which I will, uh, with which I will spend most of my time. There is a related bacterial version. Uh, this is tricorn and this is the deck P. So you see they all have rather different shapes. They are all huge with molecular weights around one million Dalton, consisting of uh, many subunits. So they have different shapes, but they have in common the fact that the active sites are buried inside, in all of them. And regulation is to allow access uh, to the active site. So let me begin with the proteasome. Now, uh, this is an intracellular protease, very, very dangerous, as I already mentioned, because if it were active constantly, then it simply would chew up uh, the uh, proteins in the cell and kill the cells. But this should not happen, therefore it is there, you will see that, in a latent state. Now what does it do? It is central in the cell cycle control. Uh, it is central in the stress response. Stress response means that upon stress, proteins in cells become damaged, no longer functional. And the proteasome recognizes when a protein is not functional, is damaged, and eliminates it, so digests it. It is central in antigen processing, so if a virus infects a cell, then uh, the uh, proteasome digests parts of uh, uh, the uh, uh, viral or also bacterial uh, cells and into peptides, and these peptides are then recognized as foreign, so not uh, peptides from the own protein repertoire, and they are transported to the cell surface and trigger the immune response. So the proteasome is central to the immune response. Well, this is another uh, cartoon-like uh, uh, presentation of the role of the proteasome. This is the proteasome again. This is uh, the uh, involvement in the cell cycle. I'm sure you have heard about the polyubiquitin labeling of proteins because it was honored with the Nobel Prize in 2004. So these researchers found that proteins that are to be degraded are labeled with a label, with a polyubiquitin label, and then uh, are recognized as as uh, being to, to, to be degraded. 
Well, uh, these are, for instance, cell cycle regulating molecules. Now, this, the, the cell cycle needs signals to go from one state of the cell cycle to the other. And these signaling molecules are proteins, which should be there for only a short period of time, just a few minutes, and then they must be removed, otherwise the cell does not progress to the next stage in the cell cycle. And uh, the signal for degradation of the signaling uh, uh, molecules is polyubiquitination. And the executioner uh, for this process is the proteasome. So this label is recognized by the proteasome and then the signaling molecule is degraded. This is the proteasome as a waste cleaner, so it recognizes the nature of proteins and uh, degrades them into peptides. And this is its role, as I already mentioned, in the immune response. So if uh, this is from a virus or a bacterium, then it is recognized as foreign, is called antigenic, it's transported to the cell surface and then triggers the immune response, inflammation for instance. One of the hallmarks of uh, a beginning immune response. Now this is the proteasome, a huge uh, molecule consisting of 28 subunits. Uh, this is a space filling representation that we see here. Uh, and we see already, so the active sites are marked by inhibitors. This is these little blue objects that you see here. So they are internal, and you also see that the particle is closed. So there is no entry uh, in this form. So the activity is very low. It is in a latent form, as we say. And uh, activation is by opening the door. I come uh, back to that uh, uh, later. Well, uh, this is a more detailed uh, view of the active site of the proteasome. So the active sites are internal, and there are two times uh, seven uh, subunits, which in principle uh, carry the active site, but only uh, two times three of these are actually active. So the molecule uh, has uh, removed the activity of four, two times four of these uh, 14 uh, uh, residues uh, also because uh, two times three uh, active sites are sufficient for the uh, uh, functioning of the proteasome. Now these two times three active subunits have different specificities. So they cleave after uh, different uh, uh, residues. So there is an active site which cleaves uh, after uh, lysine or arginine residues, this is called tryptic activity. There is one uh, that, well, there are two that cleave after apolar residues, this is called the chymotryptic activity, and there is one that cleaves after uh, acidic residues, which is called post uh, clue uh, 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 activity. Now we when looking at the structure, which we immediately could explain why this is so, there is a, a binding site close to the, uh, uh, to the residue which initiates the cleavage, which harbors either a basic residue, a lysine or a arginine. Uh, in this case, so it's a, a, a sub, it's a, a pocket which is very acidic and therefore binds positively charged residues. There is a, uh, a pocket which uh, uh, is very basic, so it binds acidic residues, uh, glutamates and aspartates, and there is a neutral pocket uh, here. So from the structure, we 
immediately could explain the basic specificities of the proteasome. Well, I have to skip a lot of this uh, uh, work that we, that we did on explaining structure and functional relationships of the proteasome, and I now jump to uh, uh, development uh, just a few years ago by the discovery of the proteasome as a drug target, a noble drug target uh, for cancer for uh, multiple uh, myeloma. And the discovery was uh, such that an American uh, pharmaceutical company discovered that these boronates here, the formula you see here, this is a peptide backbone, there is a boronic acid group here, are uh, uh, cancer drugs for multiple myeloma, and they found that their target is the proteasome. This was very exciting, a noble strategy for fighting uh, cancer, and uh, so people pursued uh, this uh, new strategy uh, very intensely and uh, tried to find out uh, other uh, molecules that also inhibit the proteasome for the purpose of developing uh, noble uh, cancer drugs. Now what you see here in yellow is molecules that had been found in natural compound libraries, in fungi, in bacteria, uh, in plants, which all very specifically and strongly inhibit the uh, proteasome. Now we analyzed the structure of all of them bound to the proteasome in order to enable the chemists to uh, synthesize these natural compounds. Now natural compounds uh, are first made from natural material, as the name says, but you usually for further development need a relatively large amount. You need gram quantities or perhaps even kilogram quantities, which you cannot obtain easily from natural sources. You have to synthesize it. And uh, you not only synthesize the natural compound itself, but you also would like to make variants, perhaps to simplify synthesis or to change uh, 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 the efficacy. And this we can do by structure-based drug design. So for that purpose, we uh, uh, did the crystallography. Now there was, I come, come to that in a minute, but would like to uh, mention another quite exciting development of the proteasome as a target for new antibiotics because uh, researchers had found that uh, the proteasome uh, when inhibited then kills malaria parasites and they found uh, uh, compounds that specifically uh, inhibit the malaria uh, uh, proteasome and kill the malaria parasite. So this is a new avenue uh, for uh, malaria uh, antibiotics. The same is true for tuberculosis. So they found that inhibited the proteasome of mycobacteria uh, then uh, kills uh, 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 mycobacteria. They in addition found uh, specific inhibitors of mycobacteria not touching the human proteasome. You do not want to kill the patient, you want to kill the pathogen. But this is possible uh, uh, and uh, with the proteasome as a target if you find uh, 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 sufficient specificity. The, this is how we approach it by analyzing the crystal structure of these inhibitor proteasome complexes uh, what our basic result is, is this electron density. Uh, we know the structure of the, uh, well, it's the, we, we know the structure of the compound. 
and see how it binds to the active site residue and uh, can delineate the important uh, uh, components of these natural compounds and uh, perhaps modify uh, them with the help of uh, the uh, chemists. Well, it's not easy to see for you on this small screen, I'm sorry. Well, there, there are very interesting uh, new chemicals, uh, synthetic, also synthetic chemicals, have been found inhibiting the proteasome. This is an epoxomycin uh, uh, called uh, epoxomycin, which is an, uh, has a keto group and an epoxy uh, moiety and reacts with the active site of the uh, proteasome by forming a morpholino ring. So a quite complex chemistry that occurs inside the enzyme. This is a related compound uh, that has a ketoaldehyde group. It also forms a ring with this N-terminal threonine, but this is now an oxacine ring, which is reversible. So by using these two compounds, we can uh, uh, analyze the function of closely related irreversible and reversible inhibitors. That's an interesting aspect of uh, in, uh, in, in drug development. Well, I have to uh, speed up uh, and uh, perhaps uh, skip some of this, but uh, would like to mention uh, uh, a system that we studied together with a plant biologist, Robert Dudler in Zurich, who had found that a plant pathogen, Pseudomonas syringae, which kills bean plants, does so by secreting a virulence factor called syringolin. This is the formula. Now we found that this syringolin inhibits the plant proteasome and kills the bean plants uh, in, in, in this way. Now how did we find, now we found in vitro and by crystallography, this is the syringolin bound to the proteasome, so this is its electron density. Uh, it turns out that the hydroxyl group of the active site threonin adds a Michael addition to this uh, carbon atom, forms a covalent bond, and uh, functionally we see when we analyze the bean plant cells, we find an accumulation of a cell signaling molecule conjugated with uh, ubiquitin. So this is a clear sign that the proteasome does not work because it's inhibited, as I said. So the cell cycle does not progress and uh, the plant cells are driven into apoptosis and die. Well, an interesting uh, further aspect of this work was the finding that uh, uh, a human pathogen, which is responsible for lung diseases, secretes a virulence factor that is chemically closely related to the syringolin. It's called lidobactin. And as we uh, see from crystallography, it reacts with the proteasome in patients. Well, what do we do uh, with our art uh, and uh, our research? So we analyze structures of inhibitors of the proteasome, many of them, and this is an overlay of these many structures that we analyzed bound to the proteasome and inhibiting it. So we, in this way, map the, a large part of the binding surface inside the proteasome. And this information we now can use uh, for a game. So we 
can assemble in different ways these site groups that we found bound here and uh, plan, design, and then make new uh, molecules. So this is called uh, structure-based uh, drug design, or in this case, fragment-based uh, 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 drug design. We use fragments that we see uh, in experiments and combine them in different ways. Quite an interesting approach uh, in uh, pharma uh, development uh, in the recent years. Well, I see that the time passes by, and I think I skip now much of this pick out uh, uh, this example of uh, a huge protease that works downstream of the proteasome. Now the proteasome that uh, I have described so far in its function was from higher organisms. Uh, and uh, there its products, the products of the, the, which are octapeptides, can be used in, uh, for the immune response. Now, if we look at uh, archaebacteria, uh, then we also find a proteasome there, which is structurally very similar to the uh, proteasome in higher organisms. It is somewhat chemically simpler, but it has the same architecture. Now, uh, archaebacteria do not have an immune response. They do not need octapeptides for an immune response. They need amino acids. And therefore, the octapeptides that the proteasome makes uh, need some further processing. And there is a huge machine uh, in uh, archaebacteria that recognizes specifically these octopeptides and degrades them into smaller pieces in dipeptides and in amino acids. Now, amino acids, archaebacteria can use. Uh, they can reincorporate it into uh, proteins. So, the proteasome of archaebacteria looks like the higher organism proteasome. Actually, this was uh, the first proteasome that we analyzed even before uh, uh, the proteasome from higher organisms. But how does this uh, 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 prote uh, this protease look like which cooperates with the proteasome? A huge protein again. Uh, now, a different architecture, uh, it has a, a threefold axis, so there are two trimeric oligomers forming a hexamer. This is the individual subunit, it has about 1,200 amino acid residues. But the, in, the, the, the degrading side, the, the active side, is buried inside. So we defined the mechanism by doing crystallography with small chemically synthesized inhibitor molecules to find out how it works. Now this is a movie that shows how substrate enters the molecule and products exit it. So there's an octopeptide coming in, being bound at the active site, and then a dipeptide is cleaved off and leaves uh, the molecule through the other side. So all of this, uh, of course, we cannot observe in the crystal lean state, because this is a fixed state, but we can analyze many uh, uh, different uh, states of the uh, of the uh, protein and uh, uh, make the movie. So the situation is such that the substrate enters the protein 
through a, a narrow propeller structure. Propeller structures, these are typical protein structures which are, uh, have a central hole. So the polypeptide chain folds around here but leaves a central hole. Uh, and there may be seven propeller blades or there may be six propeller blades. Now through this seven propeller blade entry, uh, the substrate diffuses in and products are released. Now, uh, the, this protein, I forgot to mention the name, is called tricorn, uh, that makes dipeptides. Now, uh, dipeptides are also useless for further, uh, uh, for, 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 for the archibacterium, it needs amino acids. And so there are amino peptidases waiting and they are waiting at the exit tunnel of uh, the tricorn to make, uh, 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 to make amino acids. So actually in Archibacteria we do have a huge machine which consists of the proteasome, this tricorn and this amino peptidases to make from large unfolded proteins, damaged proteins, single uh, amino acids. Well, <clears throat> now how much time do I have left? Well, uh, actually, None. Uh, it's finished, but you can go on for maybe two or three minutes. Uh, well, two or three minutes is... Uh, uh, I, I simply have to skip, but would like to, uh, to tell you the essence uh, of uh, this uh, uh, story that I had announced already. Now, in the last uh, five uh, years or so, we found a new regulatory mechanism of a protease, and that is associated with proteases which are called DEX or HTRs. Now, DEX stands for uh, degradation, the P stands for periplasm, this is the bacterial version, and uh, there is a human version as well which uh, is named HTR, uh, uh, which uh, 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 stands for high temperature. Uh, so the construction scheme in this huge family of HTR or DEC proteases is conserved throughout the living world from bacteria to humans. They have a protease domain and they have PDC domains. They play a big role. They play a role in plants by degrading uh, the damaged photosystem. It's quite interesting to mention that the photosystem, which, which is the central photosynthetic element in plants, has a very short lifetime. The lifetime is only a few hours. So it's very quickly turned over uh, in, in plants. Now, why uh, is it so uh, sensitive to damage? It's so sensitive to damage because uh, this is the uh, bacterial photosynthetic reaction center that we analyzed uh, uh, 25 years ago. Which, this is the work which led to the Nobel Prize. It had been mentioned. Now, uh, there is, in the photosynthetic reaction center, there is electron transfer and there is radical generation. Uh, and this is extremely uh, uh, dangerous for the protein. Uh, it becomes damaged and uh, the lifetime, as I said, is very short uh, in plants. Now, these damaged photosynthetic reaction centers have to be recognized as non-functional and have to be removed. And the uh, protease that recognizes and removes is a, a DEC uh, protein. So this is one role 
uh, of the uh, DEC proteins. I skip this. There is an enormous role in uh, uh, human cells uh, in signaling, in matrix remodeling, uh, in degradation uh, of waste, uh, and there is a role in bacteria. And this is actually which we, uh, with which we started our research. And I just use a few minutes uh, to tell you uh, this uh, story. Now, these DEC proteases screen the uh, periplasmic space. Now, gram-negative bacteria do have a cytoplasmic membrane and they, they do have an outer membrane. Now, the outer membrane uh, has to allow uh, small molecules to diffuse into the cells, and, uh, but in a controlled way. And uh, for this purpose, the membrane uh, is made permeable by the integration of outer membrane proteins. They, they, they are there in order to let, let's say, nutrients, glucose or what have you, diffuse into uh, the uh, periplasm and then finally uh, into the cytoplasm. Now these outer membrane proteins are synthesized in the cytosol. They have to be transported through the cytoplasmic membrane and then swim through the periplasmic space and being integrated into the outer membrane. Extremely complex processes because these are membrane proteins. So, uh, but their functioning has to be uh, guaranteed and if they are not functional, not properly folded, then, ha then they have to be removed. And the uh, police that is around in the cell, these are the decks. They uh, check whether the outer membrane proteins are intact, functional, uh, or whether they are non-functional and then they have to be uh, uh, removed. So this is the purpose of the DEX. And this was uh, what, what, what brought us into uh, this interesting question was brought us into the, uh, into the field. So what is this is an outer membrane protein structure determined by crystallography by others uh, some time ago. And it has a C terminus marked in red which is part of uh, the protein. Uh, it is an additional strand to these beta strands that you see here in this barrel shaped uh, structure. So if uh, this red strand is properly incorporated into the structure, then the structure is good, is functioning. Now if uh, the red strand is not properly incorporated, then this, the, the molecule is damaged. And this is the recognition signal, either accessible or not accessible. Now if the red strand is accessible, then this is the signal for the police to catch and to uh, remove uh, this uh, uh, protein. So this is the, uh, the deck uh, in an inactive state, a hexameric form. Uh, we saw already in the hexameric form that the molecule consists of a rigid part. This is the protease part which forms, let me go back, a trimer, the green part, attached and having attached the PDC domains in different uh, uh, conformers. So that we clearly saw from this work already that the molecule is highly mobile. So it has a stable part and the attachments are flexible. So it occurs in a closed form and in an open form. Now the uh, key observation after we had that structure uh, which brought us to uh, the basic functional properties of the system was a simple HPLC chromatography. So uh, when you incubate 
deck P hexama, which is inactive. You clearly have problems to see that, I'm sorry. When you incubate it with a substrate, casein, easily digestible by the protease, and run an HPLC chromatography after one minute, then you see the casein. You do not see the DECP hexamer, but you see a 24 mer. And if you then wait a few minutes more, then uh, all of the casein is digested. You see the inactive hexamer again and no 24 mer. This was the key observation. Then we found out what is the signal for this hexamer 24 mer transition, and the signal. Uh, was very simple, uh, just a uh, uh, tripeptide coming from uh, the C terminus of an OMP molecule. So the signal which I mentioned uh, before. And the crystallography uh, went on. So we had the structure of the inactive hexama, uh, and then uh, the structure of the active 24 mer uh, those who love geometry, let me tell you uh, how the architecture of this molecule is. So it's a large uh, spherical shell consisting of 24 subunits. And the arrangement is such that you have a cube. And on each of the, uh, of the eight edges of the cube, you attach a trimer the trimer that we saw in the uh, hexamer, and you bend the PDC domains to form this closed shell. So a cube uh, is the basic construction scheme. We also found that it forms uh, a 12 mer. Now the 12 mer we analyzed by electron microscopy, so which gave us the shape here. Uh, and uh, now here the arrangement is that of a tetrahedron. And on each of the four uh, tetrahedral corners, you attach a trimer, again the same trimer. You bend the PDC domains and you make a sphere. And inside the sphere is then the substrate, which we did not see by crystallography, but which we saw by electron microscopy. So this is the final slide and uh, the story uh, that I would like to summarize of this DIC HTRA uh, system. So we have an improperly folded outer membrane protein, which is recognized by the DEX and uh, should be degraded. So the DEX form a cage around the substrate. Now, the 24 mer deck has 24 proteases surrounding the substrate. Has it any chance? I mean, there are all these hungry, greedy uh, proteases. You would say it has no chance uh, to survive. But it has a chance because we know that it is the formation of this cage depends on this C terminal and the signal. Now, if the substrate in here is able to withdraw its signal from the deck, incorporate it into its own body, then uh, the cage disintegrates uh, and the uh, substrate in there, the OMP, is properly folded and can then be integrated into the outer membrane. So this is the decision between life and death uh, inside this uh, protease cage. It probably depends on the amount uh, of uh, damage. Now, if the substrate is very much damaged, then uh, it has no chance uh, to uh, fold inside the cage. But if it is only uh, if there is only little damage, then it has a chance uh, 
to survive and to, to do its function. Well, I would like to end with this. I, sorry, I had to skip a lot. Uh, time was uh, too short, or I spoke too slowly. Uh, I'm also should apologize for the quality of the slides. This green is just too small for this uh, uh, large uh, auditorium. But nevertheless, I thought to uh, tell you my story uh, with proteases which began uh, more than 40 years ago, uh, there were some uh, uh, substantial work that was outside this field and one of these side branches even led to a Nobel Prize, uh, the work on the photosynthetic reaction center. But I'm still uh, extremely interested in this uh, protease field also because of the aspect of uh, drug design and drug development in which uh, I'm very interested also because uh, of uh, my involvement in commercial companies which do exactly this structure determination for drug design now here for customers, for clients. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hooper. It was a very uh, enlightening speech and uh, a lecture so that we can see here um, how from basic science we can uh, go to application in medicine, which is very important, like Professor Hooper said in designing drugs uh, important, especially like uh, you mentioned for malaria and also TB, which is uh, for cancer. very important in the world. Uh, so uh, we still have some um, minutes um, for discussion because um, I, I hope we can still have about 10 minutes. Is that okay? Yes? Okay, 10 minutes for uh, questions. So I would like to invite anyone who would like to ask questions. We will open like a panel, yes. Um, Pak Rusman from there, and Pak Samsu, Professor Samsu, and Ibu um, Santi, yeah? I remember Ibu Santi. Uh, please, uh, Professor Rusman, maybe, uh, is there any um, okay, there you go. I have one question about the uh, pro protease, protease activity. If we have a, a aggregate protein, is it possible the proteasome recognize and degrade it to these small pieces? No. So uh, this is the uh, the uh, the the difficult situation, the most difficult situation for cells to, to uh, uh, deal with uh, aggregated proteins. They are practically uh, untouchable by any uh, protease. Well, this is the problem with this uh, 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 protein misfolding diseases, the aggregate formation. It's, it's a major challenge for uh, pharma research uh, right now, think of Alzheimer uh, and uh, other diseases that are related to protein uh, misfolding, a major challenge. So the proteasome can't do it. If it is, if, if it is uh, uh, already an aggregate, there are stages before aggregate formation when uh, these oligomers are still soluble, then the protein, the proteasome and other proteases can help. And this is a major uh, direction of research that we, uh, the, the, that are followed now to, to, to remove the uh, pre-stages of uh, aggregate uh, formation. 
Pastor Samsul Arifin. Professor Hugo, it was a very nice, a very interesting lectures that we have uh, in front of you just now. I just want to ask one question. They say there is about 30,000 kind of diseases around us in the world at the moment. And the disease certainly the chemical phenomena within the body of, of habitat of a human being, for example. And to what extent the knowledge about the structure of protein can help to discover a more specific drug for a certain specific disease. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, now, I used to say that uh, understanding needs seeing. And uh, in the molecular sense, we have to see in atomic detail uh, the molecules that are involved in any biological process, and also in a disease. Uh, so once a protein has been identified of being responsible or, let's say, uh, deeply involved in a disease, then we come into play. We uh, make these molecules, crystallize them, and determine their crystal structures, and from this information, then uh, we can uh, suggest, design, and make, and develop uh, molecules that inhibit or activate. So, so it, it's, our work is at the end stage, so to say, uh, of uh, curing a disease. Everything else uh, has to be, has to happen before. So the, and in particular the definition of a major player in a certain disease. This is a very difficult kind of uh, research because it turns out more and more that most of the diseases are multifactorial. There is not a single uh, player there. There are many players. And these uh, individual players then also uh, play a role in other diseases. So it's an extremely complex system. But again, once a major player has been defined, uh, then we can ve very uh, well help in, de in, in, in defining a, a small molecule or also a therapeutic protein that uh, interferes with this and with the disease. There are many examples of, of successes, and there are many more examples of failures uh, uh, as well. Some of them uh, I mentioned uh, in my uh, lecture on Monday. Uh, for instance, the clotting enzymes, uh, which are all well characterized in structures. And on the basis of these structures, in particular, the, the terminal enzyme, which is thrombin. The thrombin makes the blood clot. So we can and have designed inhibitors which uh, uh, are on the market uh, for uh, important uh, uh, diseases. The proteasome I mentioned in this lecture the design and development of a drug for uh, multiple uh, myeloma. So, a long, difficult process. We are at the end of this, but nevertheless, I think it can importantly contribute. Thank you, uh, Dr. Santi.
Professor Huber, thank you very much for your inspiring presentation. I only have one question. Did you ever know that you would get Nobel laureate before in 1988? Thank you. <laughs> well, this is a question which I uh, expect from the students this <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> but I can, uh, as, as you uh, asked it, I uh, will answer it. Now, <clears throat> we had uh, done this work on the photosynthetic reaction center starting in 1982 or so, and then uh, wrote the uh, final uh, publication in 85. There was much excitement uh, in the uh, community from, from all sides, from the chemists, uh, from the biologists, and from the physicists. Now, the physicists had studied the system, the function of the system, with uh, uh, extremely elegant uh, spectros spectroscopic methods before they had found the, the spectral properties uh, of intermediates the electron transfer, the rates of this electron transfer, very exciting work showing that this is uh, a, a, the fastest biological process that is known. So electrons are transferred within picosecond between components, which they had to call the XYZ because they didn't know what it was. Uh, the second important uh, aspect of this work was that it was uh, uh, a crystalline membrane protein. So the question is, how do membrane proteins look like? Now we had already in the 80s, of course, information about soluble proteins, but how do membrane proteins in a, hydro, uh, uh, in, in, in a hydrocarbon environment uh, look like? So in a way, we or our work switched off the light. For the physicists, they suddenly saw the components. For the biochemists, they suddenly saw how membrane protein looks like. So uh, this was uh, regarded as important. And of course, then rumor started that uh, the three of us uh, who were involved in this work uh, were candidates. But one should not. Uh, 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 take that too serious. Uh, uh, this is damaging for the own psychology, I would say. If, uh, if, if, if you wait uh, in uh, October for the announcement and your name is not uh, on the list, uh, so, so this is uh, one, one should not. One should simply forget it. Uh, well, but then in early uh, 1988, I had a call from Stockholm, from the a chairman of the chemistry committee. Now we knew each other very well because we had a common interest in another protein, in an oxidase, a multi-copper enzyme oxidase. Uh, so he the chairman, his name is, uh, is Paul Malmström, was working on lacase by spectroscopy, and we were working on a closely related ascorbate oxidase by crystallography. So he was in a situation like the physicists with the photosynthetic reaction center. He had spectral data on mass, uh, but did not know what to, how to interpret them. So he then heard that we uh, had finished the structure of ascorbate oxidase that was in beginning of 88. We we're going to publish it. So he called me and said he would like to see it. Uh, so he came and we did not discuss about the photosynthetic reaction center, but uh, about uh, uh, ascorbate oxidase. So I drove him to the airport then. He was with me for two days. But before he left the institute, he wanted to have passport photographs of myself and of my two colleagues. 
So you, uh, why, why did he uh, want passport photographs? Now this was, you should not forget, the pre-internet time. So if you wanted a picture of somebody, then this was not in the internet because the internet did not exist. You needed a photograph, a physical photograph. So I gave that to him and uh, thought myself, now uh, it has happened, and it's exactly these three photos which then appeared in the Stockholm poster in uh, December. So I knew, uh, now to answer your question, I knew the beginning of October that it would happen, but I did not tell anybody, not even my wife. <laughs> Thank you. Um, actually, uh, our time has finished, but I would like to invite maybe from the students. I see so many uh, young people here. If you, uh, you can, boleh uh, bertanya dalam bahasa Indonesia, nanti saya bisa menerjemahkan jika ingin. Ya, sebutkan nama. Ya, silakan. Satu saja mungkin pertanyaan. Uh, thank you. My name is Nur Hayati from Chemistry. Uh, pardon before. My questions are not really related to your topic, but on Monday, uh, I have heard that you talk about chlorophyll. So my questions are much more about chlorophyll. Uh, I have read that chlorophyll is mainly divided into two functions in photosynthesis process. First one as a center of reaction, and the second one as an antenna. My question is, uh, do they resemble to each other from its electronical structure? If the structure is same as each other, why do they have different properties? The second one tends to exhibit uh, electron transfer, and while the other one exhibit fluorescence. And if they are different from each other, what is the reason which allow them to have different rule of selection? Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I did not understand which two proteins did you... You, 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 you ask for the, why are two proteins of photosynthesis different? Now, which two proteins are these that I did not get? But chlorophyll, chlorophyll uh, function, uh, first one, as a center of reaction. And yes. the second one, as an antenna. Well, the, the, the antenna uh, that I mentioned were the antennas in cyanobacteria, which are huge uh, phycobilisome organelles, they do, have, do not have a chlorophyll. They do have open chain tetrapyrrhal systems. Biosynthetically, they are made by similar routes of biosynthesis, leading to chlorophyll uh, and uh, leading to heme and then also uh, to these open chain tetrapyrrhal uh, systems. Now, while in the photosynthetic reaction center you do have chlorophylls, the cyclic uh, molecules. So in the phycopilosomes you have open chain tetrapyrrhal. Now the spectral properties uh, are different. You see, you would like to harvest as much of the spectrum of the sunlight as possible. Now, if you have only a single chromophore, like a chlorophyll, then that absorbs a relatively narrow uh, bandwidth of the sunlight, and everything else is lost, is not converted into an electric current. Therefore, you have spectrally different light harvesting uh, antenna, or however you may call it, complexes, to collect as much of the uh, sun's spectrum as, as possible. But all of this has to be fed into the photocell. You see, what, what happens is 
that these indefatigabilism, this is what I know most, you have an arrangement uh, with, of, uh, of components that have slightly different spectral uh, uh, properties, such that the outer components uh, absorb uh, the shortest wavelengths uh, of the sunlight. And then comes the middle component, which absorbs mostly uh, a somewhat longer uh, spectral range, and so on and so forth. And then comes the photosynthetic reaction center with its chlorophylls. That means that the sun, uh, much of the sun spectrum is actually absorbed by the whole system, but in addition, uh, short wavelengths light uh, is traveling down between these chromophores, losing some energy, being converted into thermal energy, until it reaches the chlorophyll. So a very sophisticated system with the purpose of absorbing as much of the sunlight spectrum as possible, and for that you need different chromophores. You see, you can never make it with one chromophore. You need different chromophores. But all then, all this energy is fed into the single uh, uh, chromophore that is in uh, the photocell, the photosynthetic reaction center. Very, very elegant solution. Was this an answer? Yes. <laughs> well, it was a long answer. <laughs> uh, well, uh, since our time is up, um, and we have other uh, things uh, that we have, uh, we would like to, uh, we have enjoyed uh, and we, uh, Professor Hooper, your presence indeed has strengthened our community um, and for sure inspire us of keeping up our spirits and especially for our young students. Um, we hope you will enjoy the rest of your stay in Indonesia. We thank you for giving such a good uh, lecture and I would like to thank again to all the audiences and Bapak Ibu mohon berdiri kita sekali lagi memberikan aplaus uh, yang meriah. Thank you, Professor Hooper. I uh, give back uh, the floor to uh, the organizer. Hadirin yang kami hormati, ladies and gentlemen. Again, we thank Professor Huber for the great lecture. And we also thank Professor Titania Chandra Wati Nugroho for having guided the lecture. I would like to let Professor Huber know that Professor Titania is from the University of Riau which is located in northeast Sumatra, other island, uh, around two and a half hour flight from here. And she just arrived this morning to attend this seminar. Uh, hadirin sekalian, S uh, ladies and gentlemen, now photo session, um, uh, sorry, poster session. But while that is taking place, we invite, uh, uh, and I would like to announce that to those who are interested to have their photos taken with Professor Huber, please come forward. And we really um, have to ask uh, if Professor Huber willing to do it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I almost forget. We welcome Professor Ahmalik Ahmaloka together with Dr. Muhammad Abdul Qadir to present souvenir, a gift from ITB for Professor Robert Huber. Uh,
please, Professor Huber, come forward again. And another gift from the Indonesian Chemical Society. Thank you very much. Untuk a photo, tadi saya sudah mengumumkan ini poster session, tapi tampaknya hadirin lebih interested untuk taking photo ya. Baik, ada permintaan panitia bahwa foto akan diatur dua kali diambil. Uh, yang pertama dengan senior scientist dari uh, yang hadir hari ini, lalu kemudian dengan tentu yang uh, the next generation. <laughs> ya, silahkan diatur untuk uh, pengambilan foto katanya hanya oleh kamera panitia. Silahkan Bapak Ibu berdiri di depan uh, panggung. Professor Huber, please come forward to the podium. Ibu Titania as well. <laughs> 